Chapter 8 is one of the many climaxes um, of the novel. It's when the last day when we find the dead body of Hyde and we're confused who's the voice behind the cabinet door. And Utterson and Poole actually kind of almost break down and really admit to each other what they're frightened of is going on. And Poole, much more, sees a complete transformation and thinks that his master has been murdered. So they hear the voice has changed. Um, and Utterson says, was that my master's voice? Oh, uh, sorry, Poole says that. And Utterson recognizes perhaps it's changed. And Poole's really upset because he's worked for 20 years for Jekyll, 20 years. And he feels like he knows, he knows Jekyll intimately. And he goes on about this later in the chapter too. And he says, no way is it changed. There's something else going on. Because... Eight days ago, when we heard him cry upon the name of God. So, so here we get that tension between religion and science. So here, here we have someone locked up in a lab who is weeping when he hears the name of God. And he said, there's something wrong with that. Poole is disturbed. Um, and he says, he evokes heaven again. He says, why is someone staying there? Uh who isn't him and won't go away. That's a question. It's a thing that cries to heaven, Mr. Utterson. It's like we need, we need religion here to explain what's going on. Um, and Utterson is utterly, uh, Utterson is utterly, Utterson is the rational one. He says, okay, look, let's say I'm with you. Let's say Jekyll is murdered. Why would the murderer stay there? doesn't make any sense. So he's trying to be right. He's trying to reason it out. He's trying to reason it out. He's trying to use logic, um, you know, and he's calling Poole's story wild and, you know, unregulated and maybe speculative. And then he comes back and he says, okay, look, fine. I'll reveal everything because you're really a hard man to satisfy. And he tells the story about basically um, pieces of paper being thrown out with a requirement of chemicals and Poole running around town trying to get these chemicals, smuggling them, stealing them back in almost in an illicit way um, and, and them not being good enough and being sent back uh, and being sent out to get more. And here we really get this sense, well what we know by the end of the novel is that the drugs don't seem to be working anymore, the chemical compound he got initially must have been a special one to allow this transformation. It doesn't seem to work. But what it seems like to pool is it's an addiction. A vice, like a like drugs and alcohol, that have taken over um well one of us might think that it's Jekyll in there, but Poole seems to think it's this drug addict Hyde who's completely demolished, has murdered his master, and is obsessed and has need for this drug desperately. And he just keeps sending the servants out to help him get it. So what we're really seeing here is there's not only a mystery, but there's a limit now to science. There's a need for God to, to ask for forgiveness, for need for intervention, and uh, a real fear that... Utterson and Poole have that something really bad's happened. Poole thinks he's been murdered. Utterson thinks there must be a more rational um, way of describing it. And the passage, the second passage in chapter 8, shows us that more of a background of what's happened. It was this way. I came suddenly into the theater. He slipped out to look for this drug or whatever it is. And there she could see him. He whipped up the stairs, the other thing, he moves quickly. He moves quickly. Uh, and he made his hair stand up like quills. It isn't my master in there, he's saying. It's some other beast. If it was his master, why would he cry out like a rat and run from him? 
so Utterson, again, so this is the mystery, you know, why, what, what is up with this grotesque, um, evil-inspiring creature inside of there? And Utterson, again, rationally, he uses rationally, comes to the conclusion that he's really sick, he's tortured and deformed, um, it's what's changed his voice, and he's addicted to a drug, um, so he's addicted and sick. And Utterson kind of comforts himself with this, with this idea that that's all that's wrong with him, and we just, we just have to save him. And, and Poole rejects this completely, and he says, uh, that's completely ridiculous. And this rests a lot on the description of Hyde. Descriptions of Hyde. He says, look, I've been working for this guy for 20 years. I know exactly what he looks like. And he's tall and he's beautiful. Whereas, well, fine build of a man. I don't know how you'd want to say that, but dwarf. There's something repulsive, deformed, and terrifying about this creature that's in there. Uh, I've seen him every single morning. This is a mask or some transformation or murder. So this idea that, you know, what we can see outside is really who we are is really, it seems to me, what Poole's reaching for, whereas Utterson is going for that rational, almost scientific explanation that there's some sort of addiction or problem with Jekyll that he can't express and that fits in completely. And then of course, they finally can't handle it any longer and run up to the door and, and demand to be let in. And Utterson says, my suspicions are aroused. I'm, I'm fearful, I'm worried. As if his suspicions haven't been aroused the whole novel. I mean, um, and then you get that fair and foul. I, mean, I think Stevenson uses those doubles throughout the book on purpose to make you think about uh, the connection, that duality. So if I can't get in by letting you in, I'm going to get in in a foul way again against the rules, which is really ironic. Um, And Hyde, it's Hyde's voice he recognizes. Have mercy. He uses religious language. Forgive me. Show some mercy. Be peaceful. Don't break down. But he, he, won't, he won't listen. And so here we get uh, a door that started this story, a door that got Enfield thinking, and now a door being broken down. So we get that structural connection of doors and Hyde makes a dismal screech like an animal. Uh, and finally they break in and this is what they discover. A body contorted, twitching. Uh, they look at Hyde, not Jekyll. You know, he, he, his clothes are too big because when he transforms he shrinks. The cords of his face still moved, so he's twitching, and it's as if there's still life in him. And by the crushed vial in the hand, the strong smell of kernels hung upon the air. Self-destroyer, he commits suicide. So he can't handle it any longer. Hyde can't face the world, and we can't tell if it's Jekyll or Hyde, but somehow, some Hyde, it seems has killed himself, but what we, what we notice is that contortion, that brutality, that, that body and voice that isn't at all resembling Jekyll's anymore, but is this dwarfish beast. And we're left again with another mystery and two documents, Lanyon's and Jekyll's. And Jekyll says, three documents actually, and Jekyll says, please read Lanyon's version of events before you read mine so that you can understand exactly what's taken place. Uh, so over the course of the novel you get all this tension rising, 
chapter 8 is the one where all the big reveals, occur, well, where, where the body reveals occur and the real tension of breaking through the door. And you see Stevenson um, continually uh, has these moments of excitement and then leaves us to explain later on. So this gets the reader excited, confused, horrified, and we really go along with the emotions of both Poole and Utterson.